folks, that's good singing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. These are not hired entertainers. These are people that love the Lord. They're singing. Amen. Church today doesn't know the difference. Amen. And you get a lot of the old stuff when you hear them sing. A lot of people in church house today, they've never heard anything old. Everything's contemporary. And some of the contemporary stuff is good. Some of it's good. God has his way in every generation of bringing forth what he wants you to hear. But don't throw away the old stuff. Amen. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Proverbs 19.3. I want to title the message this morning. I want to title it today, When You Get Mad at God. Well, say, now, preacher, I have never been mad at God. Oh, you're a sweet person. I'm glad to hear that. I'd like to be around you a while. Maybe some of that will rub off on me because I need it. <laughs> Proverbs 19.3. The foolishness of man perverteth his way, and his heart fretteth against the Lord. Father, bless this holy word now in thy name. Amen. Now let's break that down and get exactly what was said here. The foolishness of man perverteth his way. In other words, you follow your own light, your own will, your own way. You're going to mess up. That's going to happen. All right. Now when that happens, you can, make, you can do one of two things. You can accept responsibility for the choices you made. Come to the Lord and ask him for wisdom. Ask him to guide you because we all do that. Everybody. Everybody. We've got... Um, I don't know how many people we have in this house today, a couple hundred people, 250. We got 250 problems sitting here today. Amen. <laughs> Some of you don't like that, but that's all right. I've been around way too long for something like that to bother me. But the truth of the matter is, he's good at working with problems. He's a problem solver. Amen. You wouldn't believe what I was till I was 27 years of age. You go ask anybody that went to rural high school, say, did you know that Charles Lawson's preaching now? No, 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 no. No way, Jose. Yeah, well, he is, because I'm not the same one I used to be. And that's the point in what we're doing today. I despise religion. I hate it to its core. It's a man-made substitution for the truth. God doesn't want to talk to hypocrites. He wants to talk to somebody that will open up and talk to him. And sometimes you got something going on. There's a controversy between you and God, and you get mad at him. It's okay. I want to show you something in the Bible, how that God uses people who get mad at him. You see, the Lord's not as easily moved as you think he is. He doesn't carry his feelings on his shoulder. He's not some little meek thing walking around that you're afraid that you might offend him with something you say. Oh, no, 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 no. He made you. And he knows why you think the way you think. And he wants to help you. And that's part of who you are, folks. It is. That's part of who you are. I've heard some preachers that are so pious, all you got to do is wait for the halo and the wings, and away they go. I'm not. I'm a sorry, low-down dog. And I mean, I'm a sinner of sinners, and I need forgiveness and the grace of God, and I'll never be right with God unless I get it. Amen. And to this day, I'm, I'll be 77 years old just in a few weeks. And folks, I'm sorry, low down sinner that needs forgiveness and cleansing of the blood of Christ. And I go there every day of my life. And somebody looks at me and they say, well, what are you hiding? I'm hiding nothing. You can follow me every day of my life. You can follow me 24-7. I hide nothing. You can take my computer. You can dissect it and look at everything on it, everything I've searched out on YouTube and all of that. But I know this. My righteousness is not me. It's not something like that. My righteousness is the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. And my dear friends, even though everything may look hunky-dory in your life, you may think you're so clean, so holy, so pious, but the truth of the matter is, compare your righteousness to the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you're going to come up short. And if you'll let the Holy Spirit talk to you, he'll walk in fellowship with you and in the light. So the Bible tells us in the book of Exodus chapter number 5, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, wherefore hast thou so evil entreated this people? Why is it that thou hast sent me? What did you send me for? Why did you call me for Midian? He said, for since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he hath done evil to this people. 
neither hast thou delivered thy people at all. Two big deals here. Number one, he said, uh, you, the evil has been done. Why didn't you stop that? Number two, how didn't you deliver these people? You sent me to deliver them. Why didn't you do it? What's holding us up here? You tell me that Moses wasn't angry because he watched his people suffering. He was doing exactly what God called him to do, and they were suffering at his hand. You say, well, now, God must have backed off and said, I've had enough of Moses. No more of this man. Oh, no, 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 no. He was preparing his man for something bigger than what he was doing at the time. And the only way he can prepare you for something bigger than what you're doing is to reveal more of himself to you. And he'll do that. Amen. In the book of Numbers chapter 11, it says, I am not able to bear all this people alone because it's too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, Moses said. Well, what was the problem? They said, we're sick and tired of this, this manna. We want flesh. We loathe this light bread, they said. So now here God is sustaining them in the wilderness, giving them what they need to live. And yet Moses says they're griping and complaining. Lord, did you bring us out to do this to us here he's complaining again and he said why don't you just go ahead and kill me have you ever been there have you ever been open enough with God to come out from behind your little religious facade this little holiness that you hide behind and become the real person that you are when nobody's looking at you I'm shaking some of you people up this morning I've been at it too long you're a sinner Amen. from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet. If some preacher told you you weren't and told you he's not, he's lying to you. But he's a friend of sinners. And the fellowship that he wants you to walk in is the fellowship of light. First John chapter number one, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we call him a liar. So to walk in the light is to walk in agreement with God. You say, preacher, I really don't know what my sin is. You don't have to. All you have to do is come into agreement with the Holy Spirit of God who says to you, I love you. I'm going to take you through what you're in. You're not perfect, but if you'll walk in me, I'll take you forward. I'll forgive you and cleanse you in the blood of Christ, and you can have fellowship with the Lord. Amen. Amen. And praise God for that. So he said, I'm not able to bear this. In Job chapter number 10, Job said, my soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon him myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say unto God, do not condemn me. Show me wherefore thou contendest with me. Is it good unto thee that thou shouldest oppress, that thou shouldest despise the work of thine hands and shine upon the counsel of the wicked? He said, Lord, look what you're doing to me. Why are you condemning me? Why did you put me in this in the bitterness of his soul? It takes a man to reach a point like that sometimes to get through to God. It's not that God puts a wall between you and him. You put the wall there. Amen. You're afraid to open up your heart when you get in your closet and really tell God what's on your soul. Right. If we could just get by this self-righteousness that we all carry, and that includes me, and just open up and talk to God, then you'd be amazed at how your prayer life, all of a sudden, you'll have fire infused into your prayer life when you get a hold of God. Amen. That's a wonderful thing. And that's what he wants us to do. Did you know what Abraham did? In Genesis chapter number 15, he said, Abraham said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Seeing I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. I have no children, he said. And yet the, and yet the promise of the Messiah, Genesis 3.15, is going to come through me. It's going to come through my family. And yet I have no children. What are you going to do? Calling God on the carpet as if to say, when are you going to answer my prayer? Well, you see, the Lord will answer your prayer, yes. but he'll do it in his time and his way. Yes. But he hears us. Yes. But he wants us to wait upon him. Why do you wait upon him? Because it teaches us, in the first place, it teaches us patience. And my friend, patience is one of the greatest virtues we can have as Christians. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. God doesn't answer my prayers all of a sudden. 
Sometimes I pray and I pray and I pray. I got people in my family right now that I'm pouring my heart out every day of my life. I pray, I pray. I see what they're doing to themselves and I pray and I pray and I pray and I still see no answer and Satan says to me, well now where's your God at? What happened to him? Is he asleep? Is he on vacation? Where's your God? Does he talk to you like that? When you don't have your prayers answered right off the bat? Of course he does. This is how we deal. This is, what, this is the real world we live in as Christians. Well, there in the book of 1 Kings chapter number 19, Elijah, you know what happened to him, had the prophets of Baal put to the sword. And then uh, Jezebel found out about it and put out a death warrant on Elijah. And when he saw that, he heard about the death warrant. He arose, went for his life, and came to Beersheba. And belong, which belongeth to Judah, left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey in the wilderness, came and sat down under a juniper tree. Move over, Elijah. i got a place there too, son. Yes, sir. Amen. 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 I've been under the juniper tree more than one time. i got a call. Well, yeah, I know all about the juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. Yeah. I know a preacher a few years ago put a gun to his head and blew his brains out. Yeah. I knew another preacher put a rope around his neck and hung himself. I've known preacher after preacher after preacher down through the years that has committed suicide right here in Knoxville, Tennessee. Yeah. Amen. 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 You say, how could something like that happen? Because, my dear friends, they are a target of Satan, number yeah. one. He wants to destroy that preacher. If he's preaching the Word of God, they want to destroy him and give him no peace whatsoever. But the problem is, sometimes the preacher gets to the point where he begins to rely on the flesh and not the Spirit of God. And when that happens, it can happen to any of us. It could happen to this preacher. I could do that. I'm not above that. Neither is anyone else in here. Commit suicide. You know teenagers today are killing themselves? Did you know that? They're killing themselves. Why are they doing that? Because this materialistic, empty, dead, vain, meaningless culture in America offers them something that can never satisfy the soul. And they're in the process of maturing their brain. They don't know how to handle this stuff. They haven't been through it. They don't have 50, 60 years behind them of experience. Here they are 15, 16, 17 years old. When I was 17 years old, I was as scatterbrained as they come. I was as scatterbrained as a 12-gauge shotgun with buckshot shooting the thing just scattered out there. I was scatterbrained. And that's what happens. And this is what's happening now. And we're losing our kids. We're losing a whole generation of them. And so he said, uh, he sat under the juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die. I'm finished, he said. You're done with me. It's over. He was judging God by his circumstances. Don't do that. Don't judge him by your circumstances. He's in control of circumstances. He worketh all things. And the Bible said, and the angel of the Lord came the second time, touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey's too great for thee. Boy, here's the old, you say what a, Looks like God would have abandoned Elijah. I mean, after all, good grief, after talking like that to the Lord. Did you ever, did you ever read about uh, Martin Luther? Yeah. Yeah. Martin Luther? Yeah. Martin Luther used to talk to God like you'd talk to somebody in the room. Right. Martin Luther said, now you started me on this thing right here. Now how come you didn't do something about it? Where are you? Where are you? What's going on? And look up to heaven and talk about it like talk to God like that. Can you imagine something like that? Yeah. But did you know he didn't kill Martin Luther? He used Martin Luther. He did. He used him. So the Bible says, Elijah cried out to God. In the book of Exodus chapter number three, Moses said, who am I? Who am I? That's what David said. Who am I? Who am I? The Bible said in the book of Judges chapter six and verse number 15, Gideon. When God called upon him, Gideon said, Oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? You're not going to save Israel, Gideon. You're a tool in the hands of the one who will save them. Right. It's not up to us to figure out how to grow the kingdom of God. Amen. It's not up to us to build no. his church. No. That's his work, yeah. not our work. All he requires of a steward is that we be found what? Faithful. 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 In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 6, Jeremiah, when God put his call upon him, said, Oh, oh, Lord God, oh, you, you've messed up this time. I cannot speak for I'm a child. Like God didn't know he was young. Are you kidding? God makes no excuses. Listen, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He makes no mistakes. No mistakes. In the book of Jer in the book of uh, Genesis 12, Abraham, 
Abraham feared for his life and he was willing to offer up his wife, Sarah, into a harem for his life. Look at this. It shall come to pass and the Egyptians see thee and see thee they would because Sarah was beautiful. Yeah. Yes. And you better believe that Pharaoh, when he laid eyes upon that beautiful Jewess, he would have definitely, yeah, boy, I'd heard of my harem. Oh, yeah, that's what he was going to do. And he, Abram said, this is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will save thee alive. Say, I pray thee, you're my sister, that it may be well with me for thy sake, and my soul shall live because of thee. Well, there's a half truth there. How many of you know the Bible? She was his half-sister. Yes, she was. Yes, she was. In Numbers chapter 13, But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they're stronger than we are. They're stronger. These are the spies. When God offered them a victory, they, they backed off. They, they, quick, they, they, they shook. They were afraid of what they saw. Well, the Bible says the battle's the Lord, not ours. The man of war that Joshua stood there, he stood before the captain of the host of the Lord. He said, take your shoes off, he did. You're standing on holy ground. Yes, yes he did. This is, the, this is the sword of the Lord that's drawn to go out in battle. He said, don't you worry about what your ability is. It's what God called you to do. You do that. You stick with that. And you'll be okay if you do that. I read this on the internet. A Christian woman recently told me she was dealing with anger towards God. She's mad at him for the pain and suffering she endured when her husband died suddenly. That stuff happens, doesn't it? Yeah. He died suddenly, leaving her with few resources. She had concluded that she had cruelly been a victim of a marriage of convenience while being otherwise deceived by the deceased. So she felt, my goodness, I've been used. Here we are. He's dead, and he simply just used me, but it gets worse. Her unfortunate situation was compounded by the discovery that her children took little interest in her plight. She descended into an abyss of self-pity, resentment, and anger towards God. Folks, this town and this country and this world is full of people that are angry at God. Give, give them space. Be merciful to them. Be gracious. Don't, don't, don't judge them. Until you walk in someone's shoes for a little while, you really don't understand the kind of world that they're living in. Because I've seen this happen. I've seen young men die. I've seen little children lost. I've, I've seen this happen. I've seen families turn against each other. I've watched it. You see these, these kind of things. They go on inside a church house. So, you know, don't give, give this business of self-pity that's, that's, that's terrible. But people have it. They have a, a person who, uh, most of the time, a person who feels so sorry for themselves is because nobody else does. Yeah. No man cared for my soul, David said. Yeah. You find that in churches. You find such coldness toward each other. Yeah. There's no real fellowship. Right. Suffering. The Bible said, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. You should never go through bereavement, loss of a loved one, a dear, precious loved one, and no one care? Well, you don't care about hearing them sing in the choir. <laughs> you don't care about being around these people in their worship service. They don't care if you live or die. Who they? Find you someone who does. And the only way you're going to find somebody that does is find where the Holy Ghost is moving because the Holy Spirit's the one who brings that compassion and love. That's a spiritual thing. I want to move on. This is important. This is very important, these next few things that I'm going to say. God will bless someone, and sometimes it's somebody you don't like, and you get mad because of it. Never been on, have you ever known anybody do that? You remember Jonah? You remember what Jonah said? God brought him up out of the whale's belly. By the way, do a little research into that whale. You'll find out they've been lying to you. There are whales out there in different parts of the ocean that could easily swallow a man. Easily swallow a man. Don't kid yourself. Don't kid yourself. I was reading the paper yesterday. Some fellow, I forget where he was, uh, he said he was out in the water and all of a sudden everything went black. <laughs> he thought a shark had gotten him or something, but he didn't feel any teeth. But then he felt pressure inside and all of a sudden the light came on and out he came. 
a sperm whale had swallowed him or some kind of a big whale. Swallowed him up, boy, and spit him back out. <laughs> whale, whale knows what's good to eat, eh, man? <laughs> yeah, apparently he didn't like him for supper. You know, when men and women reap what they sow, they often harshly judge the one who rightly judges them. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also Amen. reap. Amen. If you sow to the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. It's not that we take glory in that. I don't. I do this. Listen, if I send it out, it comes back to me. If I sow it, I reap it. I'm no different. We're not exempt from that. But he's a good God. Are you, what are you sowing today? What are you sowing? What's going forth from your life? What kind of life are you living? Is it a fake put on or is it real? Say, so what's a real life, preacher? When you're trying to walk in real fellowship with God, don't worry about how close the next fellow's walking or what some great spiritual uh, truth he has that you don't have. You just do what you do and get sincere about it. And just walk with the Lord as you walk with the Lord because you are you. There's not another you anywhere else in the world. That's a good sign of the Almighty, that, uh, that the Creator. There's, there's not another you in existence. A lot of people say, thank God there's not another Charles Lawson, amen. I say, I saw some poor devil the other day. He looked almost like me, and I thought, good night, nurse. <laughs> Hostility directed towards God often lands on his servants. For example, David and Jesus owned the words, the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. Yes. Psalm 69, verse 9. Let me give you some universities, and we'll come to a close here in a minute. Universities, yes, the University of Midian. Moses spent 40 years there. He learned what it was to idle himself around, do nothing for God. A wasted life, yet God was preparing him. Amen. You ever notice how God uses shepherds? Yes. Then there's the Juniper Tree University. How many's ever spent a little time under the Juniper Tree? Everybody raise your hand. A lot of you don't know, really understand what the Juniper Tree was about. It's about a man running from God and about a man f full of fear. And he's, he, probably, he, he was probably confused. Confusion shows up in all of our lives. And the juniper tree, I've been there. I've sat right next to Elijah. Like, how many times you wouldn't believe? Whale College, you know, Jonah, Jonah went, spent some time in Whale College. He learned a lot of things in Whale College you can't get in the classroom. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And then finally there's the Valley of Tears. What's that? The Bible said Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter who? You know who he is. Petros. Peter, say thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. The rock there is Petra. I'm not building it on Peter, I'm building it on the great rock, Petra. The difference between Petros and Petra is Petros is a stone, small rock. Petra is a large, boulder, huge. So Peter found out what was really inside Peter. And when he found out what was really inside Peter, he wasn't able to handle it. And he had to go out, he had to have a crying session. And it was at that crying session, I personally believe that the word came to Peter and said, hey, Peter, what? Don't bother me. Look at me. I'm a failure. I'm a total waste. I'm a braggart. I'm the one who said I'd die for him. I jerked my sword out there at Gethsemane and I whacked off an ear. What do you want to talk to me for? Don't waste your time with me. I'm a failure, Peter. Shut up and listen. The angel showed up and said he wanted to see you personally because he's alive. He's what? He's alive. He's what? He's alive, Peter, and he wants to see you. Oh, no greater words could have been said to anybody. No, 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 no. Then Paul, third time, he went to the Lord. He said, Lord, remove this. Take this, whatever it was. We don't know what it was. Nobody does. But please take it. This uh, messenger of Satan's buffeting me. He's wearing me out with it. The Lord said, my grace is sufficient. I'm going to leave it. I'm not taking it. Don't ever let a preacher tell you that God guarantees that he's going to heal you of all your problems. Not going to do it. But he does heal. So don't just quit easily either. Don't just roll over and say it's God's will. No, you keep coming back to the Lord with it. He went three times. It took three times the apostle went to him. God said, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to leave it. And his will was done. So Paul on his third time. I went on the porch this morning and I sat down. I always go, I go early. I'm getting to the last four or five nights. I haven't slept probably. 
I don't know, a handful of hours. I went out on the porch and I sat down and I started talking to God. I had to. Because when I got up this morning, I had a spirit coming down upon me, weighing heavily on my soul. I do not want pity from anybody. I want you to understand what a spiritual battle is. When I woke up this morning, I woke up in a spiritual battle, weight coming down on my soul, weight. I went on that porch and I said, now, Lord God, there's no way in the sun I can get up there and preach to those people like this. No way. There's no way. Now, unless you've got up and preached to people, you have no idea the pressure that's put on a preacher. Amen, yeah. How many preachers we got in here today? Raise your hand. Every one of you preachers will agree with me in a heartbeat that you are in a position where pressure comes on you that does not come on anybody else. It's pressure. It's unbelievable pressure. And that pressure was bearing down on me. Satan wanted me to shut up. He wanted me to run. He wanted me to stick my head in the ground. He wanted me to leave. He wanted me gone. Well, the problem is that I was born a fighter, been a fighter, and I'll die a fighter. I found out what, what, a, what a fighter was if I was one at Paris Island, South Carolina. I found it out. I had to find out for myself. I found out. I found out. I found out. And it, it made a difference in my life. And to this day, I'll fight until I die. Amen. I'll fight. I love this church. This has been my home for 47 years. I love Temple. You know that I poured my heart out. You know I study the Bible. I don't claim to be a, you know, but I study it. I read the Bible in order to have something to say when I get up in front of you. I want you to know that right now, one of the greatest assault that's ever been brought against this church is being brought right now. Right now. It's coming against this preacher and it's coming against this ministry. It's coming. I want you to pray for Temple Baptist Church. Amen. I told you last Sunday, five people got saved watching this ministry. If you just do a little research on your own, you'll find out that God is blessing this church like you would not believe. He has blessed Temple Baptist Church. And until just a few weeks ago, this church was moving like you would not believe, just as smoothly as it possibly could. God was blessing. Everything was going the way you'd expect it to go. This naive preacher did not have enough sense to understand that Satan will not let that happen. <laughs> he has come against us. I want you to pray for me. Would you do that? I love this church. I'm in the ministry. This is what I do. I want to quote you something that my pastor used to quote to me all the time from Third Creek Baptist Church. His name was Bill Cardwell. He said, touch not mine anointed, do my prophets no harm. And that's true. Let me give you a warning this morning, okay? And please take it to heart because I'm giving it to you in the spirit of truth. If God's man is doing what God wants him to do and he's where God wants him to be, you are in bad trouble when you come against a man like that. You are in trouble when you come against him. If he's doing what God wants him to do and you come against him, now, here's the problem. Don't try him. Don't try him. There are people dying right now that have done that. Don't try him. Pray for him. Because I'll be here until God's done with me. And I'm not going anywhere. And nobody's running me off. When I first came to Temple Baptist Church in 1976, I was green. I was born in 73. I came here in 76. I was green, didn't know anything, <laughs> but I knew I was saved. And it's for, for, for 47 years, it's been one battle after another, and that's to be expected because Satan hates this church. Back then, though, when I first came to the church, it was the Marine that fought him. <laughs> it was. It was the Marine. <laughs> well, that was a long time ago. Now it's an old veteran pastor that's been at it a long time. And I've been in the battle. How many of you will pray for this church? Please pray for Temple. Please pray for this church. I love this church. Don't let somebody rise up in this assembly and try to tear it down and tear it apart, whatever their motive might be. Don't let them do it. Amen. I'll fight you to the death. In Jesus' name, Lord, use what I've said. 
glorify your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I think I got my message over this morning. I believe I did. In thy name I pray. How many in this house today are willing to fight for your families, for your loved ones, for that matter, what matters to you? Well, there's no weapon greater than prayer. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty unto God to the pulling down of strongholds. So I'd ask you today to pray. I ask you to please pray. Pray for me and pray for Temple. I love Temple, folks. This is a good church. This is a good church. This is a good church. I pray for Temple. And ask God to do what he wants to do in here with us. We raise it up. Glorify thy son. The Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you for every soul that came down here this morning. I thank you, Heavenly Father, for the, the move of the Holy Spirit of God in this house. Thank you for what you've done. I know you love Temple. I know this is your church, and I know I'm here because you put me here. And Heavenly Father, I'll be here till you're done with me. And I pray, my prayer has been and will remain to be as long as you have me in this world that I'll be able to do what you've called me to do and be able to preach and teach and minister the word of God. Lord, I don't want to wind up somewhere where I'm just living and I'm not doing anything. I don't want that. I don't want that. When you're done with me, take me. My Heavenly Father, I give my life to you this morning. I consecrate it. And I pray for these dear people. They all have families. They've got loved ones. They've got children. They've got parents. They've got husbands and wives. Just like, just like I do. Like all the rest of us do. They've got burdens on their soul. They've got prayers that haven't been answered. Some of them may be in a state right now where they're angry at you. Some of them are going into it. Some coming out of it. Some of them are shouting right now. Hallelujah. Shout. Glory to God. Shout. But some of them are crying right now. My Heavenly Father, you're the one that knows. You know all about it. You know everything. There's nothing you don't know. But Heavenly Father, let this morning, let this day today be a mark. Let it be, let it be established that Temple Baptist Church is going on. And Satan needs to understand, he needs to understand that we're not going to roll over and just give up and quit and hand it to him. It's not going to happen. By the grace of God, Lord, help us. Let the Holy Ghost move now in this place. I give you my life, Lord. I give you my life again. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do any of you folks that prayed this morning have anything you'd like to say? And if you have a special prayer request. Yes, ma'am. All right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes. All right. Anybody else? You have a prayer request? All right. Folks, this is a spiritual battle. You understand that, don't you? It is. Yes, ma'am. Yes. All right, good. I'm glad he answered it. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, it does. I know. That's exactly what I preach. Yes. Yes. You, right. We're totally dependent upon him. Yes, we are. Totally dependent. On anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. You understand? Yes. 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 Battle rages. Yes, sir.
Yes, he does, brother. Amen. All right, anybody else? All right. Well, I'll tell you this, and I'll shut up. After I prayed, talked to God, that spirit just lifted right Amen. off of my soul. Amen. I don't know how many times that's the only reason I was able to get up here and preach to you this morning. That spirit lifted off of my soul, and I was able to do it. My wife looked at me a little earlier and says, I don't know how in the world you're going to be able to get up there and preach. Because pastor's wives, folks, Amen. go through exactly the same thing the pastor goes through. They go through the same thing. Yes, they do. All right. God bless you. Let's stand up and we'll have a word of prayer and we'll let you go. We'll meet again this evening at 6 o'clock for the evening service. Just keep praying now. Keep praying. Satan does not like prayers. Yes, sir. All right. Yes. Let's pray. Brother Bobby Gaynor, dismiss us, please.